particular, um, and to welcome you all back on the second day. It's a great day, first of all. Um, to welcome uh, Dave, who has come from uh, University <coughs> of Arts in, in London, and he's the head of, I actually had to do his technology and has learning, but it's, it's head of digital. Yeah, I changed it for HR, I didn't believe me, so. <laughs> <laughs> As so HR for you. Yeah. 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 But uh, we know uh, Dave for all his extensive work at the University of Oxford and with BBC as a consultant. I suppose more particularly around about the paradigm of uh, visitors and residents and you know, online behaviours uh, online. So um, delighted to, to welcome for two two parts. Uh, this part is uh, you know presentation before we have coffee and then we come back for a workshop session. So very much. Thanks. I'm happy, I'm really happy for people just to ask me questions throughout. I'll try and leave a space at, at the okay. end. I have a bad habit of running exactly to time. So do nudge me. Um, so, uh, yeah, good morning. Um, I, I think this is billed on the program as about visitor, visitors and residents. So what I'm going to do is actually I'm going to kind of approach visitors and residents like you would a kind of slightly highly strong horse. Do you know what I mean? Just, just very slowly, with great confidence, um, across this talk. And what that will do is that will set us up nicely for the kind of workshop part, um, which is after coffee. Okay. Um, so, yeah. I come from the University of Arts, London. You could probably tell already that, I mean, it's interesting to get invited to something about Generation Z because I'm, the, the, generation, the, the generational thinking, if you like, is something that I'm quite skeptical about, but that, and that's quite obvious when you get into the kind of details of the visitor and residence idea. Um, but I think, but I think that's, I think that's a good thing to have these sort of different perspectives. I'm not sure, I, I mean, I would have liked to have been here yesterday, but I don't know quite how Generation Z was framed yesterday, so I might say something that, but you know, that's, we're in an academic environment, perspective, different views, you know. So, um, just before I get stuck right into it, uh, I'll explain very briefly about my institution, because not many people know, it, know of its existence, okay. So this is fairly indicative of my institution. Uh, on screen is, there's a, a, a media person getting uh, an honorary uh, degree or doctorate, and then on one side of her is our Vice Chancellor, Nigel Carrington, and the other side is our Chancellor, Grayson Perry. You have to guess who's who, okay? <laughs> now, uh, I think the, the point I make about this image is that everybody is wearing strange outfits. We just don't think, we don't think this is strange, but when you look at it closely, it's quite strange, but Grayson probably wins. So, um, and, and it's typical of my institution, you know, it's a, it's a big creative institution, it's the largest, um, creative, discipline-focused, higher education institution in Europe, possibly the world. So uh, the way I put it is we've got 20,000 students all studying subjects where there's no right answer. We're currently redesigning our marking matrix. It's quite difficult <laughs> because, because of, of the kind of subject areas that we've got. Okay? You probably know about some of our colleges, places like Central St. Martins, Campbell, Wimbledon, London College of Communication, London College of Fashion, etc., etc. And we, so we deal with ambiguity and complexity, that's kind of what we drive towards. We don't try and, generally, we don't try and make the world look like a simple place. Right? That's, that's, our, that's our approach, which explains our, the way that we're, we're getting recorded on. It explains why sometimes we struggle with our national survey results and things like that. We do put our students in, into, we ask a lot of our students, but I think we're sort of proud of um, so, in terms of Generation Z, when I was thinking about this, it suddenly struck me that, age, so this is from the, the UK government website, age is a protected uh, characteristic. So it, seems, it always seems strange to me that we'd categorise things by age, because if somebody comes for a job interview, that's illegal to say, oh, you know, you're this age and, they're, and therefore. Now obviously that's in tension with the fact that most of our students will be of a particular age. So I'm not denying that, that an 18-year-old's experience of culture in the world will be different from ours. Oh, and by the way, with regard to the title, we're all old, just in case you were wondering. All of us are, okay? So that, keeps that, that makes that simple. 
Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm not saying that, that you know, an 18, 19 year old's experience of the world and culture and the way that they, they engage in technology might, isn't different from ours, but I think a straight them and us is dangerous. There's, it, I mean, it, it seems strange to me to say, it seems we're more comfortable saying, well, most 18 year olds have these characteristics, but I don't think we'd say most 40 year olds are this or that or the other, you know, but we're tempted to do that with that, with that generation. So I think it's something we just need to be uh, careful about. How many people have got like uh, connected devices with them at the moment? Right? How many people are good at doing Google Docs on a mobile phone? Yeah, yeah a few of you? Enough of you, okay. Because I thought what I'd do is I'd go teaching and learning on you and start with an activity rather than just talk at you. Okay, so I think there's, there's a really useful thing that you, can, that you can do in almost, in almost any session, okay? Which is to ask what's new about digital. So I'm asking you that question, okay? What is new and specific to digital that hasn't gone before in some form? It's, it's worth thinking about because we tend to pin this idea on digital that it's, that it's kind of all new and everything about the future is about digital. So what I'd like you to do, this will, this will test your skills, I made it a tiny URL so you didn't have to type in thousands of letters. If you, if you go to there and just note down your thoughts on that question, what's new about digital, do turn around to the people next to you and have a, have a quick chat about it. I just wanted to start the day by you know, getting you warmed up in that sense. Otherwise, it's just me talking. And you know, it, it, I don't want to become one of those people that talks about, hey, in, the last thing innovative pedagogy is is somebody talking for an hour at the front and then go on to do that. We've all been in those sessions. So. Um, it's very quiet. Does nobody know each other? Do, do, do talk, chat. We're concentrating. Yeah, I mean, I yeah. can't type and talk, fair enough. I can't walk and text, which my kids always get angry with me about. N neither can they. But you know they get angry with me anyway. Can uh, you tell sorry, can you tell I don't know. You probably do it in the browser. I was expecting people to have laptops. If it, if it proves too fiddly, then we can just talk about it. But it is, it, I mean, it's already interesting to me that almost everybody's using a smartphone to do this, whereas like three, four years ago, most people were trying to try a laptop this. So if it doesn't work on your smartphone because you haven't got the Google Docs app or whatever, then we, we could just chat about it. How are we doing? Has anybody got in there? Yeah. Yeah, good. Okay. What I'll do is while you're doing that, I'll get it up on screen. Oh look, look at that. More magic of technology. <laughs> Fortunately you're all anonymous, so you can't see who you don't get to find out who does the most typos. <laughs> so it's an interesting thing that this, this, this never fails, you know, the idea of saying, go to somewhere and start typing, everybody's fine with it. I've never had a group of students who didn't just go, okay. Um, I'm happy to see the word hyper in there already. If you can't get in, then talk to a friend who has got in. We'll just do this for another minute because obviously we've already got more than enough stuff to talk about.
30 seconds. There's no time for actual thinking, just write whatever. <laughs> it's a great approach for education. Forget reflection, just type. Okay, you can, obviously you can keep typing, but I'll just pick up on something. So, so even in a room this size, it, you, you get a lot of stuff very quickly this way. Um, so always on, yes, connectivity, I'll come back to that. Um, somebody wrote attention span. Um, now, I'm not sure, I'm not going to pick people out. So with students, it, this can be a really nice way of picking people out because quite often the students who are less likely to say something out loud will have written something really perspicacious. And you can say, who wrote this? And it kind of invites them, and then they'll start chatting. It's really nice. So, yeah, I'm not too sure about attention span. I think that's, that's, um, that's slightly contentious. Um, VR and AR, you should add AI and blockchain and you know what I mean? You know how there's always, you know, there's always um, letters that, that kind of cir circle around. I've not got a problem with any of those technologies at all. It's just in intriguing for me that VR has been the future of everything at least five times in my working life. Do you know what I mean? It's just got a bit cheaper. Yeah, thank you. You've got blockchain or blockchain. I don't know why. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> and we don't know who that is. Um, uh, sharing, collaboration. Uh, y yes, I mean, obviously, sharing and collaboration you could do before digital, um, but yeah, I see what you mean. Big data, in a way, yes. I mean, I call, I, I call it um, post-Victorianism, because apparently in the Victorian era, they felt like there was a kind of layer of sort of scientific philosophy where they were saying, well, we've figured everything out now. All the, we've figured all the theory out. All we need to do is to be able to measure things really precisely and then we'll just understand everything, okay? My, my worry is that big data is this thing where we're saying, well, well, we'll be able to collect everything and therefore we'll be able to know everything. These are two very different things. Um, loca not, not location dependent, I think, is a, is a big deal. So, just uh, because of time, I'm gonna sort of move on from this. But the thing that I want to focus on is the connectivity, okay? I think the idea of the sort of collapse of geography is important as well, all right? So, one of the biggest, well, there, there, are, two, there are two really, there are three, yeah, comfy chair, yeah. Um, there, there are um, a small amount of really important things about digital that don't, re, that didn't really <coughs> exist in quite the same way before. One of them, relates to this, which is that idea of connecting between people and objects, okay? The level of connectivity, that's definitely new. <coughs> I think the other one that we often miss, which is odd given, given that we're in education, is the fact that anybody can publish, right? That's a huge paradigm shift. So if you think about something like Wikipedia, the only reason it exists is because anybody can publish. It's enormously powerful. Uh, but obviously that's, that's somewhat in tension with traditional academia, okay, and we'll come back to that. So those are the two, those are the two major ones really, is, is the level of connectivity uh, and the fact that through that connectivity, everybody has the potential to have a voice, right? Uh, and then just in terms of the sort of Gen Z thing, I don't know who said this, but I think it's very wise. We aren't addicted to our phones, we're addicted to being social. You see this happening time and time again with technology, especially connected technology, is that, uh, like the, the, the landline telephone, you know, that was invented so that we could, the, the, the theory was we'd just use that for admin and organizing stuff, like I'll, I'll meet you in the cafe or what have you. But of course we appropriated it to social ends and used it to maintain relationships at distance. 
So you see that time and time again. The technology comes along with a very kind of pragmatic theory behind it, and then it's appropriated socially. And you see that with the web. Can I ask the question, you, know, you have We Are Addicted to Being Social. I mean, there's an article, I was listening to the radio before I came in this morning. There's a school in Kerry which has banned smartphones. Yeah, and it's happening in the ban. Yeah, the, the, reason why, the reason why the headmaster gave us that people are now more engaging with each other and engaging with the teachers and uh, happier. So there's an argument you could say that uh, smart technology is far from being social, in the sense it's anti-social. I mean, I remember 20 years ago, you used to get on the train and people talk to you. Now you get on the train and they look at somewhere else like they are here today. When you said, do the stuff, everyone was heads down. Yeah. So what, in the sense of social, in terms of people interacting, I would say, I'd say there's a very strong argument for saying that the one thing that new technology is, and you could list up there, is that it's anti-social in terms of mm -hmm. people in the old sense of the word, is social. Yeah, so I, I social think... Social beings, you know, interacting with each other personally. Yeah, so that you brought up a whole load of really, uh, so yeah, that's a really good point, that's, I think, and I've heard that from other people before where they've said, oh, I look at my students and they're all sat in a row just staring at their smartphones, they're not being social, it's isolating them. But what's on the other end of their smartphone is people. So, so what happens is that the, the, the network gives us an opportunity to connect with who we want, but not necessarily who's geographically local to us. Yeah, well, yesterday's talk, one of the points where the speakers made, that yeah. we're far more individual now. The new technology yeah. has made us much more individual. Yeah, yeah. I'd agree much with more that. more individual, you know, yeah. not social. I mean, I know what you mean by social. Yeah. Social in terms of, you know, messaging and so on and so forth. Yeah. But it's a different kind of social. It is a different kind of social. And I think a, a good way of looking at it is the idea of strong and weak bonds. So, um, uh, for instance, so, so when you're growing up with your family, you have strong bonds with your family because you kind of have to, right? Because you rely on each other and you all live in the same house. Uh, whereas in the network, if you like kind of social media social, you might have a lot of weak bonds, okay? And they're more convenient to you because they don't necessarily involve you investing in relationships and they don't necessarily involve personal sacrifice in quite the same way. And I think a really good way of kind of testing for that is saying, what happens if something awful happens to you? What happens when you, if, if you have a disaster, right? The answer is the people who, who you have strong bonds with rally round, and quite often they are the people who are physically close to you, and the people with weak bonds just go, you okay, hun? You know, and it doesn't really make any difference, right? So I, I, that, that whole area about individuality and weak bonds, I, 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 I I can see that, I agree with that. If I was writing that sentence, I'd write, we are all addicted to being, or many of us are addicted to being digital social. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 think it, I think it's dangerous to draw a distinction between digital and not digital. And I think if we're talking about, okay, I'm, gonna, I'm going to do something that I don't really want to do, but let's say we're talking about Gen Z, okay, Th then perhaps that generation doesn't make a digital, physical distinction to the same extent that we do, okay? So I'm very um, wary of the word, word real, okay? So when you, let's not forget, when Facebook came out, people would say, why have you got friends on Facebook instead of real friends? We don't have that discussion in quite the same way now. And we'll come to this with the visitor resonance stuff. We, you know, the lives that we live digitally are real. They're just not physical. So I think making a hard distinction between the digital and the physical world, if you like, around these things can be, um, it can restrict the level to which we understand what's going on. And, and even now, myself, I forget whether I've had a conversation online or face-to-face -face sometimes. You know, in my memory, obviously at the time I know. So, so I totally take your point, but I just, want to make the case that things that happen digitally are just as real as things that happen physically, although they might have different implications. And that's important when we're thinking about our students, because otherwise what happens is we perpetuate the idea that a face-to-face -face lecture is real and online learning isn't real, you know, and, and we can't really afford to do that. So yes, um, you, what, hap what happened there was you just, you, you started me off on a little speech, which is no disrespect to your point, okay? Um, I'm going to plow on. Uh, so, uh, there's another activity that can be done but we're not going to do, which uh, comes from the Internet Mapping Project by Kevin Kelly. And I'm going to run through this quickly because we've already got really stuck in and I feel like time's moving on. 
It's really simple, it's a great activity, and you get really interesting things like this. Okay, so here's a map of the internet, and this is what's really interesting about the digital, which does link to what we were just discussing actually, is that it's like an imaginary space. Okay, we all have a different picture, when you say the internet, we all have a different picture of what it is. So here's somebody's picture, that's 12 year old, which is like the kind of servers and wires sort of view. There's another one. Uh, that's a bit close to how I think of it. Uh, here's another one. Great interpretation. I think that's kind of like an informational interpretation. Yeah. Um, and then the last one I've got to show you is a cloud of happy people, right? So in a way that speaks to what I was... I should have just shown that really, shouldn't I? Look at that. Show not tell, Dave. Come on. Um, and I think what's interesting about that, that's all, the, that's all the answer to the same question. And that is a, is a decent answer, and that is a decent answer, okay? So for some people, the digital is, is a set of tools, it's a set of technologies. For other people, it's more just the people that they connect with. In the same way that if I make a phone call, I don't really think about the phone, I think about the call, right? Because what's happened is that technology has become transparent, it's become disintermediated, it's become transparent, it's disappeared into use is a good phrase. So for a lot of people, it's not like they use their phone, their phone is an extension of themselves, selves, you know, using that very particularly. And, uh, you know, I'll be honest, if, if my phone battery goes dead, I feel like there's less of me. All right? Because I've lost those connections. And that's why people get tense. Anything less than 15% is a bit of me that's going to vanish. Okay? Okay. You laugh, but I know, that you, I know you know what I'm talking about. Right? And it's not because, it's not because the, the phone is like a tool, it's because the phone represents all those people I connect with. You know, that's, that's because, of, because I am, you know, we're all social. You know, we, 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 we're, we're part of that kind of network of people. Would you accept as a group of people who would actually find a 15% liberating? The fact that you are yes. connected. Yes. Yeah, and, and I think there are. Yes. Yeah. And so, I suppose my exceedingly unsubstantiated theory about this would be that, w that we, are kind of, we are addicted to be being social, but not necessarily in the best ways. And so, we feel that anxiety, and then when we have, like, if you go out without your phone, you're like, oh, I haven't got my phone, and you go, oh, this is, oh, look at the world, oh, you know. So, what, what we're very bad at doing is giving the choice between being connected and being thoughtful and reflective and all of those things, and meditative, we'll tend to be connected. Because it's kind of hard at work, uh, in some ways, even though it can be liberating. So, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, this is good, I like people shouting at me. I mean, not shout, that sounds bad. No, I can't, no, no. So, exceedingly quickly, I think it's useful for me to be honest about where I come from in terms of education. So I see education as a process of becoming rather than, and I, I think that that's, that's quite often shared across the higher education sector, but not necessarily evenly. So here's somebody who puts it better than I can. And um, Ronald Barnett said, sort of had a good little analogy for it. He said, if you ask somebody who's graduating uh, what they thought about, you know, university, they're unlikely to tell you what they learnt in, you know, module four of year two. They're more likely to say, well, it's kind of changed the way I think about things. Or it's, you know, it's changed. So it is it's like a transformative process. And I'm, to I'm totally into that. I don't care. I don't care. I'm a truth and beauty guy. Do you know what I mean? I think, that, I think that's how it should be. So when I come to think about education, I, I'm, I'm quite interested in, in, the, in the top part of this pyramid. It also fascinates me that educationists are obsessed with pyramids. Absolutely obsessed. Okay? And, and obviously the problem with these kind of diagrams is it, makes you, it, it gives you the impression that it's like a ladder. Which they, they tried to take the edge off this with the classic extra arrows there. Okay? I, lo I love diagrams. Um, but, and I think when it comes to the digital, we have this, we, we tend to take this kind of, well, first of all, you've got to learn how to work it, and then, you know, eventually you might get up to the kind of identity, the more kind of esoteric becoming stuff. I think actually our experience of digital technology is lots and lots and lots of little cycles, bouncing backwards and forwards, okay? 
So most of our student incoming students, a lot of <coughs> most of their engagement with technology will be up at the top of that pyramid, but it will be kind of social. It won't necessarily be scholarly. Okay. Um, it's not like people are in Facebook for the uh, at the bottom. It only takes people a very short amount of time to move up to the identity piece. Okay. And a, and, and a really important point, and I think this is where we get really stuck in our institutions, is that academia is not the same as learn. I'm not saying we don't learn in academia, but often where, where we feel there's a tension between students' practices in terms of the way they go about learning and the digital and our institution is because when we're thinking about our institution, we're thinking about the practice of academia as a discipline. And when we think about the students, what they're desperately trying to do is learn stuff. And if we've been in our jobs for a while, sometimes we forget that cycle. So, uh, you know, basic, I, I suppose a thing to cross-check is, when you, what, what do you do, I'm just asking this question rhetorically, but what do you do when you have to learn something new for the first time? Okay? You've got to fix the plumbing in your house. You've got to learn how to do whatever it might be. You know, you've got to plant a new garden. You can learn a new subject. What do you do? Okay. Because our students are constantly learning something for the first time. So they'll do the same as most of what you do, which is Google, read the Wikipedia page, watch a YouTube video, you know. And yet in our institution, somehow, not necessarily explicitly, but implicitly, we kind of hint at the idea that that's not the best way of doing it. But we do it. So I think we can be really disingenuous with that. Okay. Um, so that's worth taking into account, is a, a lot of students have very effective learning practices that don't look like academia. But most of our students aren't really required to be academics. Do you, know, you can get most of the way through an undergraduate course with a bit of Googling, a bit of Wikipedia, and a bit of messing about, right? Which is, and by messing about, I mean pretending you've read the references that you found at the bottom of the Wikipedia page. Now, if you've got a problem with that, you need to change the way that you teach, right? But actually, you know, and all students, well, just about all students, are really good at understanding that, that game. It takes them a bit of a while. So they'll go, okay, I've, I, I'm going to learn this way because it's really effective. Works for me. It's quick. It's efficient. Uh, but then when I present what I've done to my institution, I'm going to make it look like academia. Yeah. So we actually kind of put our students in a position whereby they spend quite a lot of their time just kind of formulating what they're doing in, to make it look academic. And that's one, one of my favorite, I mean, this, this is disingenuous towards students, but one of my favorite things is what I call Yoda writing, which is where students think it's academic to write sentences where all the grammar's mixed up. You're like, oh, that sounds academic. <laughs> like, just don't. You, you must have all seen that, right? And you're like, why are they doing that? It's because they've got, from somewhere, they've got this idea that that's what you're supposed to do. Yeah? And personally, I'd say it's because most academic papers are written in an appalling style, which has got nothing to do with communicating ideas. Okay? Not all of them. Occasionally, you come across a paper and you go, oh, academia makes sense, because this person is such a good writer. They, they use that method, they use that, that form of, of communicating so elegantly that it all makes sense. But it's quite rare. Anyway, that was a bit polemic. Okay, so there are lots of different ways of thinking about learning. Uh, it could be like, you know, this kind of spiral idea. It could be like a scaffolding idea. I think with the digital, we have to consider <coughs> this kind of more networked principle of learning. This is, this is, to a certain extent, this is how people are learning now. Not how people are doing academia, how they're learning. Okay, and. The, the, the best theory around that is connectivism. It, 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 I, I can't ask you to put your hands up because it's, it's a weird thing. Just like nod lightly if you know anything about connectivism in a way that, yeah? So a few people do. At the neurological so, level. So, what's that? At the neurological level, you mean? No, I mean connectivism is an educational theory. Yeah. Um, so a lot of the, the way that we teach in higher education is um, uh, uh, not cons 
constructivism, yeah? Yeah. yeah. Uh, which, uh, which I, oft, I, do the, I have to do this session which is about constructivism, constructionism and connectivism, and it's a total nightmare. So anyway, um, it's well worth taking a look at, sort of, sort of appeared around about 2004, I think it's very prescient actually. Um, and if you look into connectivism, which is a set, uh, the reason I bring it up, because it's essentially an educational theory which deals with the fact the network exists. Okay, and if you look at it, I'm not going to go into this in detail. Um, it's really difficult. Okay, I don't think it's possible to actually be connectivist properly. So there's four sort of tenets to it, and 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 these are the first two. Okay, I mean you can you can you can. Google your way to this. Um, I mean, there's, there's 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 a lot in here, and these are the next two. But you can compare and contrast those four points with the structure of a kind of traditional undergraduate degree and the way it works. You can see there are areas where it's very much in tension. Okay, point three. Borderline impossible. I don't know how you're supposed to do that, but it's a beautiful thing, kind of philosophically. Okay. So it's, it's, it's actually a very rich theory, and uh, George Siemens, who, who was one of the people that proposed it, this, this, is, this is one of my favourite little quotes. And so I think what happens with that connectivity is that, is that information, content, knowledge, if you like, becomes abundant. And so fundamentally, our incoming students are used to the principle of abundant knowledge. Our institutions are still structured as if knowledge wasn't abundant. Okay? It's, it's that simple at one level. And that can be confusing for students. Okay? But the idea of we, we teachers are the arbiter of connections, that's kind of a gorgeous little phrase, I think. And, and obviously chimes with the idea of the, of the network. And so that comes back to that point that I started with, with connections between beings and, and all objects, okay? So a really simple example of this is, um, it's, and, and you'll have heard people talk about this before, it's now more, of more value to know where to find something than to know what that thing is, okay? Because I can find anything, I know where my phone is at all times, I can find, I've got everything on the, everything's on the end of my phone, right? Not everything, but a lot, okay? So if, so if I know how to seek out information, then that skill is more important than just remembering a lot of stuff. Now I know that sounds trite, but it's a big deal, because you have to ask yourself the question, is that how our courses are structured? Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. Uh, a really great kind of cultural effect of this, and this was this was something I read here for a while back, is is the way that quiz shows have shifted. So I don't know if you remember Ask the Family, which when you look at the clips of it looks really terrifying, right? Uh, but Ask the Family was all about things. Yeah, it's like it's like um, University Challenge. It's all about being able to remember big chunks of knowledge. I mean, you have to be, you have to infer and make connections as well. And then you have a quiz show like QI, which is not about so much about knowing stuff, but about being able to play with information. Okay. So, um, because, and I think that is an effect of the digital, like a cultural effect. So, here's the heart of it for me, if we're thinking about, if we want to put it in Generation Z terms, okay, I'm happier to put it like this, which is that we have incoming students that essentially operate 